I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. The howl of a wolf may thrill or frighten you, or haunt you in an unearthly way, evoking a sense of sublime awe. If that wolf happens to be howling somewhere nearby, well, then some people grow angry. But taken just as raw animal vocalization, it strikes me as archetypal, primal in its essence. You'd be the odd one out to feel nothing at all. In the 19th and 20th centuries, gray wolves were nearly eradicated in much of Western Europe and North America. This was government policy. Bounties were often put on wolf pelts, and by about 1930, wolves had been driven to near extinction in much of the American West. Then it all turned around. The general public had a change of heart, and politics around the issue of wolf conservation started to shift. In 1973, the Federal Endangered Species Act was passed, and just one year later, the gray wolf was listed as endangered. Suddenly under federal protection, wolf populations went up and up and up. Here we are, 50 years later, and Idaho, as recently as a year ago, had more than 1,500 wolves. The state of Washington last year reported over 200 wolves in 33 packs. Ranchers are among the people who aren't really thrilled with this new state of affairs. But beavers are happy. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Wolves might be a beaver's best friend. They're a keystone species, and the return of wolves has had downstream effects. Literally, downstream. By keeping large ungulates, such as deer and elk, in check, wolves make room for more plant and tree growth, stuff that would otherwise be munched way down by those deer and elk. The beavers thrive in the resurgent vegetative growth, and their dams contribute to a healthier watershed, counteracting the effects of drought and providing habitat for scores of other species. So the beavers seem to be living fat and sassy with the return of the wolf. They're good by it, as are some, I emphasize, some humans. Wolves are a component of the ecosystem. They may have been absent for decades, but that doesn't mean that they were not part of how our flora and fauna of Washington State developed and doesn't mean that they're not an important part of it now. But good luck convincing this guy. They're vicious. They're not your family dog. Some people will even take things into their own hands. The Washington Department of Fish and Game is offering a $50,000 reward for information about poison wolves in Stevens County. For the past seven months, the department has been investigating the suspicious death of six wolves within the Wedgepack territory. Toxicology results revealed all six wolves died from ingesting poison. And a few states have recently implemented kill policies reminiscent of what was practiced a century ago. Idaho's new law allows individual hunters to kill an unlimited number of gray wolves, up from 15 per person last year. Other states are following suit. Montana passed a similar set of laws this year and expanded hunting in Wisconsin this year, already reduced that state's wolf population by 30 percent. On the other side of this battle are citizens who oppose Idaho's new kill policies. The reintroduction of the gray wolf in America is considered one of the great conservation victories of recent decades. But now, more than 50 wildlife groups are asking the federal government to put the wolves back on the endangered species list. It's an effort to push back against states that are now expanding wolf hunting. In the no man's land, between wolves and ranchers, can be found range riders, men and women whose job it is to maintain a buffer zone between wolves and valuable livestock. 
These range riders are hired by governmental agencies, nonprofits, or individual ranchers to discourage wolves from messing with herds and flocks. In Washington state, range riding is one of several non-lethal approaches that the law requires a rancher to attempt before any killing of wolves is permitted. Daniel Curry is one of these range riders. This is the story of how this wolf expert and able horseman found his way into his rare line of work. And in this episode of Constant Wonder, you'll also get a sense for what keeps him there. Fresh out of high school, Daniel Curry found work for a couple of years as a tech assistant to a veterinarian. Maybe you know someone who practically from birth has been drawn to animals. That's Curry. I had a reoccurring dream. I've only had two in my life. And one of them was when I was very young and and it dealt with wolves. And it was something that just kept happening. It just kept cropping up randomly. And I didn't really consider it that much when I was younger. I've always had an affinity for animals. And I was like, you know, at at a certain point, you're going to have to pick a species. There's so many that are in need right now of help. But then I remember that dream and I was like, wow, that that maybe was telling me something when I was a much younger individual that this is your path. At 20, I was just like, wow, wolves are just, they're such a polarizing topic. They have so much heat on them in so many different angles that, that they need a lot of help. And I believe that they can teach us many things about being better humans. I was like, well, let's start calling zoos or, you know, I'm just going to find a place that has wolves. I'm going to figure it out. Some people land their dream job without having had an actual dream. Maybe the fact that Curry's dream was no mere figure of speech and something that came back and back, maybe this was the thing that pushed him toward a place called Wolf Haven. Wolf Haven is a highly respected nonprofit. It's a sanctuary for captive and displaced wolves on Highway 99 just south of Olympia, Washington. He was still quite young when he first started making overtures toward the people running the place. I called him up. I was like, are you hiring by any chance for your animal care staff? And they're like, no, we're not currently. And they're like, we're always accepting volunteers and and you can do that. So I went down there and volunteered for not too long, actually, before becoming employed. And I was like an hour and 45 minute commute one way. And I did that for like five years, I think. Anyways, yeah, I just started volunteering, showed up. They were like, well, you know, we have a job opening in the maintenance facility, and would you be interested in that? And I was like, man, I don't want to do maintenance. And I kind of talked to my family. My mom had a really valid point. Take the maintenance job and just offer your services whenever you can, and hopefully they'll see that. That happened pretty quickly, actually. I had an animal curator ask me to go in one day, and, and she's like, are you comfortable coming into an enclosure? We actually need a blood sample from one of the red wolves, and I need somebody to watch my back while I'm in there doing that. You know, I was so, so excited to have that opportunity, and I was like, I, I just will not mess this up. I want to glue my eyes to these animals and make sure that this person's safe and make sure that those animals are as, as least stressed as possible. She did what she needed to do, and, and we came back out, and she's like, well, I really felt comfortable with you there. Would you be interested in working in this? And I was like, of course. That's why I, you know, that's why I was volunteering. That's why I took the maintenance job. The next time I was asked to go into an enclosure, it was a pretty powerful moment. It was like this little wooden box that was about three feet wide, about six feet long, and it was on the ground, and the wolves had kind of dug into it, so they made it like a makeshift den box, basically. I'll tell you right now, captive wolves are a lot less scared of people. (laughs) They're very habituated to their presence, and they are actually much more dangerous, potentially, than a wild wolf. If I just walk towards them, they take off. If you walk towards a captive wolf in their enclosure, they're like going to walk towards you going, what the hell are you doing in here? And uh, there was a girl named uh, Gray that we were having to pull a blood sample from. And so I went in there with the animal curator. She was having trouble. So we got another person to assist because she's like, I need you in here you know, to hold the vein off. When you're pulling blood from an animal, you have to kind of hold their vein off and it increases blood pressure. And then you can actually find the vein easier and, and pull your sample. So she and I are in this den box and she's just having trouble. And I, I just knew in my heart, I was like, I can do this. You know, I, I can do this all by myself. I can hold off. I've got big hands, long arms. You know, I was like, and I've been working as a vet tech prior to this. And I just remember for a while there before I actually said it, though, I was kind of like, oh, don't say it. You know, finally, just in my heart of hearts, it was like, it's going to burst out. So I was like, I can do this if you want. I, I'm totally confident that I can. And she's like, are you sure? And Man, I remember that was a. The first time that I actually ever 
been close to close and touched him in that manner. We're laying on our bellies. There's a wolf at the end of this box that was three feet by three feet by six feet long. And we're just kind of, I mean, I'm not a small person. So, I'm, you know, there's not tons of room to move in there. I've got my big spaghetti arms that are trying to navigate this small space. And so it's kind of like this already dicey scenario when you look at it that way. There's a wolf back at the end of this. You're kind of like crawling down a shotgun tube and there's a wolf back there and you got to draw a blood sample. And I grabbed Gray's arm there and she let me process the whole thing. I held her, you know, I held her vein off with my left hand, pulled it with my right hand, put him in the, in the tubes and handed it back to Wendy and was like, thank you for giving me that opportunity. We backed out and she's like, wow, that was really impressive. And that's about right when I, I totally was moved into animal care. And that first time that I made physical contact with a wolf was extremely powerful. When you're working with wolves, you're working with their natural social behavior. Um, they're either going to challenge you and you're going to have to deal with that portion, or they're eventually going to submit to you. And it's a way of giving themselves to you. It's like a trust thing that they're handing you. That's the only thing that they have to give, really. What's the signal that you get that you know in the moment that that animal has started to trust you? The physical cue is they stop trying to bite your wife hole. It's like an aluminum Y, if you imagine, about five feet long. And it's got two tangs that are at 45 degree angles in the end. And you wrap that with padding. And that's something that you can interact with the animal. When you're working with them, they'll first challenge that Y pole. They'll generally grab that thing and rip it apart and kind of destroy it. And that's when you know they aren't submitting to you. There is not trust. They're saying, get out of here. I don't want you here. I'm going to attack that. And you just kind of have to remain calm. The rule of thumb is the more excited, the more amped up the animal gets, you have to compensate and bring that back to equilibrium by becoming more calm. And you'd see in some people that it's just really hard to do when you're dealing with like a fractious wolf in front of you. It's it's hard to calm your own nerves. And uh, that's something that's like a basic skill that somebody who's going to work in close proximity to these kind of like large carnivores has to have. So that'll be one one instance that they're actually kind of not submitted at all. They're very they're challenging. The other option is for them just to submit like you would see wolves do with each other. One will roll on their back. Maybe like they'll pee a little and say, I'm not a threat. Don't worry about me. You know, and that's a very typical trait from like an omega wolf. Um, when an alpha wolf or a beta wolf, a higher animal in that social hierarchy comes up and interacts with them, they're going to go, hey, nope, you're still the leader. Don't don't worry about me. You know, it's just little old me. So wolves, when you're working with them as a person, they'll do the same thing. They'll actually kind of turn their head instead of making direct eye contact with you and looking at you as a potential threat. They're going to turn their head almost to the side. And they're submitting to you and they're giving you their neck is what they're doing. And that's when you can kind of gently place that white pole on them. And then if they're going to become more anxious or amp up, you have to compensate by becoming calmer. So if they build up pressure, you put a little gentle pressure with that white pole, physically push them back down to where they were in a submissive, calm state. There's a physical cue there. And then along with just tons of experience, you start to learn other cues that are going to let you know that it's a safe time to kind of enter that animal space. So during that whole process, when we're working directly with these animals, I would sit there and slowly talk to them about what I'm doing, mainly for calming people around you and keeping them aware of what's going on, kind of giving them a timeline of like, okay, we're going to grab this leg now, guys. It's all right, Wolf. Don't worry about it. I'm going to take this syringe. I'm going to slowly stick it in their famous vein. And you're kind of letting partners know what's happening. You're keeping that situation calm. Some people aren't really comfortable being comfortable around these animals because things can get crazy in those enclosures or out in the wild pretty quick. Getting inside the mind of a wolf, I can't imagine that's easy. But Daniel Curry seems perfectly able. He strikes me as someone who will always be one who can understand and relate to an animal. And just to show you what I mean, here's how capable he is of closely identifying with a wolf, sympathizing with this animal's view of things. I went under anesthesia once in my life. I had broken my sesamoid bone on my big toe. It's a bone that barely anybody knows about. I whacked my big toe on a boulder inside the enclosure. It took an MRI to find out that that was what's wrong. So I remember being on that surgical table and having the uh, anesthesiologist saying, you know, count down from 100 and bam. I remember waking up. I was like, wow. That's kind of a weird moment. I have literally no recollection of that time frame. Anything could have been done to me. Don't have a clue what's going on. And I thought of that moment when waking up, there's an intubation tube in me. I could feel like my throat was raw. And I had all these sensations going through me. And I was like, 
every time we do that to a wolf or any animals, you know, domestic animals, if you're a vet, but every time we put that animal under anesthesia or we're working with them directly, they go through the same process without any information beforehand. <laughs> Like I had an anesthesiologist saying, you're going to feel this. I had people reassuring me, telling me it's okay. We've done this a lot. Here's why we're doing it. I have full knowledge and comprehension. I'm going in there willingly. And it was still kind of a mind altering experience. And I was like, wow. So if you amplify that by about a hundred, you know, that's kind of scary. So that's part of the reason I get to talking to these animals while I'm working with them in this really close proximity, really intimate quarters. I know they're, they're, you know, they're not understanding the words necessarily, but I think I'm giving off a, an energy that they're like, okay, I, he's not attacking us. He's not hurting us, but he is being very persistent and he is not stopping. A pair of siblings at Wolfhaven made a deep and abiding impression on Daniel Curry, a brother and a sister named Rocco and Natasha. They had been raised by a private owner who apparently had done an unusually good job with them before bringing them to live out the rest of their days at the shelter. It was the one case, actually, like 99.9% .9 of cases of captive wolves never go well. And this was a rare case. The guy put a lot of resources and time and just really loved these animals, but it became something that was just not possible to do anymore. And so they came to Wolf Haven. They had a fairly good life for about, say, like a year and a half, two years. And then Natasha, the the sister to Rocco, the female of that of that duo there, um, she became terminally ill with a disease that we still to this day don't even know what happened and into her life, unfortunately. We had a graveyard on Wolfhaven's site, there still is, and we'd bury them on site. And I remember I was usually the one to to dig the graves and I dug her grave. And this was some point in like late fall, early winter. And that area doesn't get a lot of snow or anything really. So I've dug the hole, I've dug her grave. That portion of time is very cathartic for me. I mean, you're burying a individual that you see every day that, you know, it's an important part of your life. The graveyard's location is away from the, the sanctuary. I mean, there's no way that they can see this this point at the graveyard that you're standing at. Like where Rocco is, totally blind to what we're doing out there. Wolves generally, when they howl, the whole sanctuary will erupt usually. Like it was 63 animals, the maximum capacity at the time that I was working there. I mean, that's 63 wolves that are howling in unison and chorus. It's just this beautiful, beautiful noise, beautiful, beautiful song. It really is what it is. And all of them would join in. But when an animal would, what we'd call, would, would have a mourning howl, a grieving howl, none of the other wolves would join in. They would give that space to that animal. That animal could howl deeply, mournfully into the night or into the sky. Nobody else would join in on that. It was their way of basically like helping that animal grieve is what I took it as. And so when we were burying Natasha, we went through our own little um, ceremony just as the animal care staff was putting her in the ground. And when I put her body in the ground, like the moment her body hit the bottom of her grave, snow started dumping and Rocco started howling. just this really powerful moment i don't have a clue how he knew that it was an amazing experience that he like the moment that that, that his sister's body touched the earth in her last place of rest he started having that morning now and it started just dumping snow and i was like wow there's just so much to this planet and being a human and being an animal that i just i have no concept of right now you know logically you're like he can't see this how did you know how did he know but then just deep down you know that there's something more there's something much bigger at play here. I'm Marcus Smith for Constant Wonder. We're getting to know Daniel Curry of Northeastern Washington State. He's a range rider who keeps wolves away from livestock in a place where ranch land butts up against wilderness. 
He seems to have been not only a natural at handling wolves, you can see that by now, he's also deeply empathetic toward them. You might think that a man whose day job is working with wolves has his hands full enough and doesn't need to seek out yet another animal sanctuary for his free hours. But for some reason, Curry now felt drawn to horses. And here's where two important strands of this story get woven together. I mean, a range rider needs a horse, right? It just wasn't so clear yet to Daniel Curry that he would end up doing that kind of work. His life's purpose or calling were still evolving. In retrospect, you can see how horses and horsemanship would be important components. I've always loved horses. I've always loved the thought of horses. So I was working at Wolf Haven. I started volunteering some time at a horse sanctuary. Beautiful place. It's called Equine Aid. They run a nonprofit that rescues horses from slaughter-bound equines. Some of them are just uh, equines that are being neglected. So I ended up working over there, I was putting up some fence for them. So I was like, if I can help that anyway, I love that, you know, and just let me pet some horses every once in a while. And that's great payment for a volunteer like me. So I was volunteering some time over there. There's a volunteer at Wolfhaven that ended up, uh, he had some horses. Jim is a, he used to be a sheep farmer, really good guy. Uh, kind of looked to him as a father figure that I didn't really have growing up. And there was a person named Wendy, she's the animal curator. She ended up rescuing a horse, and she put him at Jim's property. Jim had a little horse named Jack at the time, and it was a good companion for Jack. And we would go over there, and, and I would hang out with Jack and help Jim with chores and just talk to Jim. And she would go play with her horse, and we would just kind of, you know, hang out. It was a really fun time just to kind of go outside after a long day of work. At a certain point, Jim was like, you know, you can always put a horse out here, too. And I was like, well, I don't know. I don't really, I don't know if I want to do that. There was a one-by-one one thumbnail that he showed me one day on this website called SOS. The website SOS stands for Save Our Slaughterbound Equines. I was like, wow, that's a powerful sentence just right there alone. So he shows me this one-by-one one thumbnail of this horse. It's very pixelated. It's not a great picture, but it's this horse named Castle. And I was like, wow, this is a, this is a beautiful horse. I like this horse. And I was like, I, I think I want that horse. I knew from the moment of seeing that picture, that was it. I need that horse in my life and I need to be in that horse's life. So I have that night to sleep on it. And I was like, man, this is just, I've got to get that horse. So the next day I go to Jim's and he's showing me pictures of other horses. And I was like, no, no, I, I want to see that little thumbnail picture of that castle horse again. And he's like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, that's a horse. You know? So I just kind of, he was kind of unsure why I, I was just sight unseen. I'm like, that's the horse that I need to be with. And he's like, all right, you know, what, whatever. And he, but he would still kind of not stop showing me pictures of other horses. I'm like, oh, thanks for the, thanks for the input. You know, I appreciate that. But I already found my horse. And yeah, this was just a gut thing. This was a gut thing, like in that den box, draw on the blood. It was like, I, I can do this. This was more of like, I need to do this. I need to have this. It was just this connection. None of it really made sense to Jim, I think. And none of it really necessarily made sense to anybody I talked to, except for me. And I was like, for me, it was a no-brainer. I saw the horse. I saw my horse. He's on this website. He's destined to be slaughtered. Need to get him. So, yeah, I mean, I, I called. I contacted SOS, and I talked to them for a few days. And I was like, hey, I really want this horse. How much is the bill? You know, how much is the fee to rescue him? But at the edge of that little one-by-one -one thumbnail was a countdown next to it. That's the amount of time that Castle had to live was this little timer next to him. And one day that thumbnail was gone. I felt my heart kind of sink. I was like, did they not hear that I was that sincere? I mean, what, what happened? And um, so I kind of, I have a call, I have a call, I'd leave messages, not get anything back, I'm trying to think of like, how can I find the semi truck that has him on there? Stop the semi truck and say, I'll buy him. I'll buy him right now. You know, it's like, I'll buy the rest of your gas. I'll give you all my money, whatever. I just needed to figure out what happened to him, and it was breaking my heart. And I got this call randomly one day from Jerry, the owner of Equine Aid, and she's like, I, I found this horse, and I think you should look at 
I don't want to look at another horse, Jerry. I was like, I found the horse that I wanted and he's gone now. And, and she's like, well, I really think you should look at him. And I was like, why do you say that? And she's like, I don't know. I just have this feeling about him. And I don't know. His name is Castle. And I was like, right there. I just like was like, I was just talking about him even right now. <clears throat> um, kind of, I'm well up with emotion because I was like, you're kidding me. And that's like... Castle was his name. And she's like, yeah. She's like, I just, I, I rescued him from the, you know, SOS. And I was like, that's my horse, Jerry. You have my horse. What, what do I need to do? And she's like, well, you need to come down here and look at him. So I was like, okay, I'm coming now and got a ride down there. I go down there with Jim and, and Wendy and we're driving up the driveway. And I've only seen this thumbnail picture and I see him in this pasture. He's, he's out in this pasture looking off in the distance. He's kind of skinny, mini. Um, not a lot of meat to him. He's got this fly mask on. He's just standing there staring off in the distance. And I just, I was like, stop the truck, stop the truck. And Jim stops the truck. No sooner than it's in park, I'm already out the door, like running to the pasture. And I kind of ran right up to him, which is stupid in hindsight, you know, again, no horse knowledge. So I run up to him and I, I ended up taking his fly mask off so I could look at him in the eye. And by that time, Jerry and Doug were walking up and they're like, wow, like Doug could not get near this animal. Um, let alone take the fly mask off. And I was like, oh, that's a big deal. And she's like, yeah, that noise, that Velcro that you're tearing right near their ear and just this foreign object on their face and they don't know you, That's that means a lot that he let you do that. Just having that foreign object on his face, just the ripping the Velcro near the ear and having this strange man do it was a, was a testament to our future bond, I think. So now, having escaped the knacker by dint of sheer luck, this horse named Castle seemed comfortable having Curry draw up close and personal, and Curry obviously felt something for Castle. And as he got right up close to this rescue horse, he noticed serious injuries. The animal had been horribly abused, as you're about to hear. By the way, as Daniel Curry now shares with us the poor condition he found this animal in and the bond that developed between them, you'll want to know that the original name Castle was going to get jettisoned very quickly— Griff is what Curry would start calling him, and there'll be an explanation for you about that name, Griff. I don't know for any of the people that are listening to this that doesn't know what a horse bit is. It's a piece of metal generally joined in like a shackle formation inside the mouth. It sets in between teeth called the bit bar is the spot that you would set it in. And that bit is to what you hook your reins on to, basically. I did a lot of research on them when I first met Griff. Horses work with pressure, um, applications like pressure and release so if i hurt this animal on the right side of his face he'll go away from it and turn left and then that's how i turn my horse he was owned by a woman somewhere near yakima she hired this horseman to take him out and train him the guy after 12 rides came back and said you gotta you gotta put this horse down he's not a good horse so that bit the guy was using for those 12 rides ended up ripping the skin on griff's lips back about an inch and a half on either side Those scars are still present to this day. Besides just those mouth wounds, or maybe because of them, Griff didn't want anything to do with a rider. It would take a lot of patience on both sides before Curry, a novice with horses, would become a range rider with a trusty steed. So... I made him a promise then. I was like, a bit will never go into your mouth again, period. I want you to know that you can trust me as a human. I want you to know that you can trust me as a man. And I want you to teach me. We went about this in a much different way than most people do. So the first two years of our relationship, my relationship with Griff was just friends first. Taking an animal that has these tennis ball size cinch scars and had his lips ripped open literally from just poor training and poor practices. To take him out into the mountains, it was just a treat to show him that a human being can be a good thing, you know, in your life. It it doesn't have to be a bad thing. We started that journey by changing his name from Castle to Griff. And I remember that time it was a funny thing because everybody thinks Griff, Griffin, you know, it must be a GR, you know, there's got to be a Y in there. That's what they're getting at. I remember telling Jim, I was like, I'm going to spell it G R I P H. And he's like, well, that's weird. Why are you spelling like that? And I was like, I don't really know. But that's his name. So that spelling fell into place with no immediately obvious rationale, not even a slight hint of one, really. 
I'm told that when taking over responsibility for a horse, it's pretty common for a new owner to rename it this or that willy-nilly. But those letters G-R-I-P-H would make a fair amount of sense later on, as you'll see. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. We're spending time with range rider Daniel Curry. His job, let's put it very simply, it's to interpose himself between wolves and ranchers, to be a buffer on the borders of that vast wilderness of northeastern Washington. This is a place where tolerating wolves after their reintroduction to the region has been a political flashpoint not just with local citizens, but for the entire Pacific Northwest. Curry is the main character in a new book about these wolf conflicts. It's titled The Return of Wolves by journalist Eli Frankovich. We got going in this episode sketching out the basic tension here between humans and wolves. Then we heard the story of how Daniel Curry, compelled by his innate love of animals, and in particular by his fascination for wolves, insinuated himself at the Wolf Haven Sanctuary as a volunteer at first, then became a paid employee, and at this point in our episode, still working there, he has decided that getting a horse somehow ought to be part of the whole mix. <laughs> you see, little by little, he is gaining whatever experience he might need, and I would say solidifying the kind of character somebody really must have, for a highly unusual line of work. And the way I see this all working out, well, it seems to me that range riding as a career kind of sought him out as the perfect candidate. Now, don't forget that as we've been listening to him, so far he has only worked with captive animals. And the thing that will pull him out towards the ranch lands and the wilderness areas to become a moderating voice in the wolf wars, well, it was an especially nasty thing that happened back in 2012. He heard about it in the news as he was working at Wolf Haven. A pack of wolves had killed some cattle, and then the entire pack of wolves was exterminated because no one seemed able to see a better way. What I saw happen in 2012 was a rancher lost a, a lot of cattle. The wolves, every single one of them, lost their life. And as citizens of Washington, we paid an extreme amount of money to go in there and lethally remove these animals. So I felt it in my heart that it was just a lose, lose, lose. And I was like, there's got to be something that I can do. And so I looked at a map of Washington and plotted all the wolf packs that we currently had at that time. And it was right up in the northeast corner of Washington. And I was like, I put my finger there and I was like, I don't know what town this is, but I'm going to move up there and I'm going to do something about it. Up there, as it turns out, is a place called Colville, a town on the edge of national forest land. Now, I should hasten to clarify here, range riding isn't totally new something invented when Daniel Curry showed up. Guarding and managing herds from horseback, that's a very old and storied occupation. Modern range riders are paid out of government coffers or by nonprofits or even by ranchers. And for many of them, the name of the game is simply keeping wolves at bay. In Washington, the law requires that non-lethal efforts must be made in good faith before resorting to deadly force against these wolves. But the ins and outs of the job aren't super formalized. There's a fair amount of improv in how this works from place to place. The function has even taken on a bit of a taint. Some range riders have been dishonest, claiming to have been out on patrol when actually cooling their heels in a trailer with a TV and an ice cold drink. It's just not a straightforward desk job with close supervision. And if you do it right, even then you have to learn a lot by simple trial and error. In hindsight now, I'm like, wow, I remember that day when I was brought up to that area. They're like, what are you going to do? And I was like, oh, I'll just figure it out. And it's not going to be that hard. And it's just wolves and cows, right? There's a lot of hurdles that I did not foresee in the beginning. It's more of a rural urban divide. It's more of a not trusting the government when you're a rural American or a rural citizen. I love these people, you know. The, there's, I've got dear friends that are ranchers out here now. I mean, it's that important to me that, that they have an option, that they have an outlet besides the only way that we know how to deal with them is to shoot them. So a lot of it is education. A lot of it is just reaching out and trying to meet in the middle of a spectrum that is so polarized currently in so many ways. We only have the tools in our toolbox that we know about, and we can only use those that are in there. 
you know, how can I change my mind to help change my world? That's kind of how I started this. I was like, well, I want to change this world. I'm going to have to change my mind first. Kicking ranchers off public land is not the answer. It's not an answer that I ever want to see go through either. And I've talked to a lot of colleagues and they're like, that is the answer. I'm like, no, it's not. They deserve a right to be a part of this, this planet too. Curry's one-man startup there in Colville needed a name. And he wanted his new business's name to reflect whatever stance he was going to take on how to make a positive difference in this polarized neck of the woods. And I remember when I started this business for, you know, human wildlife conflict mitigation, I was like, what am I going to name it? It's just me and Griff out in the landscape, right? We're just hitting the ground. And, um, I was like, there's the name of the business, you know? I was like, guarding the respective interests of predators and humans. I was like, that's perfect. And I'm an acronym geek, so it just kind of fit. So Curry hung out a shingle with an acronym for his business, Griff, his horse's name, guarding the respective interests of predators and humans. He works on a ribbon of land not unlike a DMZ, a no-man's land, a no-wolf's land. It lies between where cattle are grazing and wolves are hunting. Some of these lands are privately owned, but much of it is public land. By tracking the wolves and disrupting their comfort zone, he nudges them to go a little further into the wild to look for their deer or elk, rather than for cattle. And he does that simply by patrolling the gap, looking for wolf sign and tracks, and then nudging them by his very presence, even by his smell, to move on. Sometimes he has to get a little creative. Imagine a big calving pasture. It's an open portion of a valley bottom. It's all fenced off. That's where these guys will have their calves. So you have a big mama cow. She drops a calf. And then right on the edge of that calving pasture, imagine just wilderness. It goes up to the mountains. That's where the wolves, the cougars, the bears, the all these other animals that are trying to find their niche and find their ability to live. So these animals that are watching them from the hillside going, hmm, that's where all our food is. Even these little cows, those are possible easy prey. So what will happen is they'll come down and they'll kind of start with uh, just patrolling the edge, finding out like what's going on. What they're doing is they're weighing risk to gain. Wildlife, especially wolves specifically, are masters at this skill. And they look at something and go, okay, I can go in there and get a cow, like a little baby calf. What is the risk there? Because the gain is obvious. It's an easy gain, easy prey. If I can hunt it, if I can get it away from its mom, it's very vulnerable. So what you don't want is those guys to be sitting on the side of the fence having enough time to think about that. We utilize tools like flagery, for instance. It's like a electric fence that has a foot and a half to maybe two foot long red flags that are maybe four inches wide and they sit there and hang. So wolves specifically are neophobic. They're fearful of like new things in their environment. Now we have this fence that they came up to. Originally there's nothing there. They're like, wow, we can just crawl onto this fence. There's not a lot of risk there, but there's a lot of game. Now in that same scenario, they come up to that flagger and they hear these noises. That flag will actually make a noise as it sits there and moves in the wind. So now they hear these little ticking noises all around them. And they see movement out of their corner of their eye and they're like, wait, what was that? So we have the flagery up, then we maybe have some fox lights or we maybe have some motion lights. So I'm sitting in the field, I have motion lights at strategic areas, I have game cams up to kind of watch the pattern of the animals. They, they can smell a human out there, they can't really see me. They have this these flags that are making this noise. If they walk to this other gate to try and maybe circumvent the flags, they're gonna maybe trigger a motion light. And then that motion light tells me that something was over there and it's not a cow. So then I get up and walk over there and they're like, wow, this is just too much action. I cannot really have this happen. This is just a non-option. It's not a viable way to feed myself tonight because there's a high chance that I might just get killed, so. Being a range rider means going where the trouble is. Sometimes that's out under the open sky, situated between cattle and wolves, on land he wants to demilitarize. But sometimes it's right in the town meeting, where he hopes to defuse tensions between angry humans engaged in civic dialogue that's sometimes barely civil. There is a lot of, uh, just in how the way people sit in a public meeting, um, you'll have the pro-wolf and then the anti-wolf, and the majority of them were 
anti-wolf in this meeting because of the geographic area that we're having the meeting in. You know, it's Northeast Washington. They're the ones who have been dealing with this subject longer than anybody. I mean, I remember going to one of the first opportunities to speak in a public commentary in Colville and like the capacity for the room was like 100, I think. And there was 300 people there. <laughs> I mean, there's cops lining the, the walls with firearms. There's people in that in that building with firearms from the community. There's people with knives walking around. I mean, it's just a scenario that's like, wow, this is pretty heavy. Like I went and sat down near the most rancher family that I could see, you know, that you would ignorantly judge them. You're like, well, they're in cowboy hats. They got the boots. They got the whole family there. I'm going to go sit with them. So I go sit with them. I mean, they're kind of looking around at me like, yeah, yeah, you, you seem to fit the bill, you know? And, and so they're already, as humans, we tend to lump each other into categories for our own feeling of safety. And that's just a really, it's just something that I don't like doing. So I moved up here to see what you guys are dealing with. I moved up here to bring solutions to the table. And I don't do that by sitting on that side of the room away from you. I do that by sitting smack dab with you. And I remember the Department of Fish and Wildlife people up on this panel and they're on one side of the room and, and people are talking to them. They get you know, an opportunity to do public comment and they're talking to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's not great dialogue going back and forth. My name gets called. And so I walked up there and trying to just open my heart. And I believe we all have spirits. And I'm trying to just open my spirit and say, like, just speak from that point. Don't go in there and accusing. Don't go in there and questioning. Don't go in there and judging. Just speak your heart, you know, like, and I, and I did not talk to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I actually turned my back to them and said, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude to you. I just feel like there's power in the public and that's what we're ignoring here. And that's who's having the issues. So I turned my back to them. And I, I said something to the effect of this community is an amazing community. And I was like, what I see though, is two different factions, two different ends of the spectrum throwing rocks at each other because they can't come to an understanding. And what I see is that your culture and the wolves' lives, those are the only things that are getting hurt here. And I was like, I don't like to see that. I believe that there is room for a win-win. And then the crowd shifts and they're kind of like, I think he might be a wolf guy, you know? So they're like, boo, boo. And they start booing me and I just kept talking uh, to the best I could. And um, there's one guy in the in the audience that he didn't stand up. He didn't even really look up. I saw him though and he and he just yelled really loud though he had a really loud voice and he just said let him talk you know and i was like wow that was huge that's powerful like there was one person in that audience that was brave enough to be like i want to hear what this guy says he's not coming here and attacking he's not coming here and, and saying that you know screw ranching screw rural america i only love wolves and it's like that was a really powerful moment for me and i remember at the end of it everybody gets up and leaves and, and there's this family Happened to be the family that I was sitting next to, you know, the one that I mentioned that was very extreme ranching looking. They just looked like real ranchers. And the uh, matriarch comes up of that family and, and the rest of the family's behind her. And she's like, I just wanted to thank you. And I was like, for what? And she said, for being brave enough to say that. And that meant a lot to me and my family. And I was like, this is how it starts. And we just kind of shook hands and they went their way and I went my way. I, I do a lot of volunteering in my time, but that's what paid me that day. I know it works. And I've seen it. I've seen people go from, I hate wolves. The only good wolf is a dead wolf to, I understand them now in a different light. I've, I've had them say that. And then I've had them say, these animals are beautiful. And that's something that's like, holy cow. That's so amazing to see that kind of switch in a person. And there's this guy that got up afterwards. And he's like, I just turned 95 yesterday. And I was like, well, good. You know, I was like, congratulations to you, man. The like, guy, I hope I can get to half of that. And he goes, I got to tell you, young man, your talk was very eye-opening. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I came in here. I didn't like wolves. I opened up the paper, and it seems like every week I'm seeing that some guy's cows killed, some some girl's horse is killed. And, and I just think of them as these horrible animals, almost demonic in a way. And I was like, well, what do you think now? And he's like, I see them more as me and how they're just trying to survive. And, man, I have... I almost started crying right there. It was so powerful to see a 95-year-old man, first of all, be brave enough to take a new look at something, especially, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but at 95, like you're pretty well ingrained in your thought process at that point. So to have him go, wow, I took a step back and this is a different, it's a different light that I'm looking at this in. And that's how it starts. 
There's an unusual degree of empathy in this man, Daniel Curry, and that empathy doesn't seem to discriminate between human and non-human creatures. Having said that, I've got to say that thinking like an animal really is his stock in trade and the key to his survival. This kind of empathetic thinking came in more than a little handy once when his services were retained to move a cougar out of a crawl space under a barn to keep the rancher from shooting it. When he got there, it turned out to be not just one, but two. I was already on my way to that property to track wolves and to act as a buffer like we were talking about. And it was wintertime. Then I got a call that, that night prior and he's like, you know, I'm going to have my neighbor come over here and shoot this one cougar is all he knew about at that time. He just was like, I have a piece of haying equipment in that barn that I need to service it and bring it out so I can have it ready. And I'm scared to go in there. And I was like, well, I'll see what I can do when I get over there. And I'll do that first and I'll get him out of there somehow. And he's like, are you sure? And I was like, absolutely not a problem. You can see him from the outside. I did a perimeter check and I went in and tracked. I was like, wow, there's a lot of activity that I'm seeing. And I think there's more than one animal. So I put my head in there and I'm looking around. I was like, there's two of them. Okay. I kind of went in perpendicular to them because I wanted to put pressure on them and have them shoot out the, the opening that they were using for an entrance and exit. So I'm six, five and a half. The space that I'm in is about at most three feet tall. So I'm like on my forearms crawling over this, the, you know, the floor joist, which is, it's a big old barn. So it's just a big log. So I'm having to like crawl over that. And then I was trying to get a little bit behind him. But when I came in, it was like right on him. It was like <laughs> right there. Curry was taking video the whole time. And in that video, you can see these beautiful animals. The very moment he first spies them and then realizes what he's up against. Here's the audio. There's the meow meow. Holy balls. We're close together, aren't we? All right, here's the deal, guys. There's two of you. We need to get out, okay? You're a beautiful cat. I appreciate you guys. That's why I'm under this barn, risking my life to get you out. There's only two of you, right? The first one, the female, she actually takes off, not really very quickly, but she leaves. And then I'm dealing with this other male back here and trying to like get him out. And all I have for non-lethal tools at this time is a ski pole that's about four feet long, my snowshoe, and I have a couple of flares. They're small, basically like fireworks that are fired from a little pistol. They just make a screaming noise. So I'm kind of poking him and He's not going, and finally, I don't know why, I, was, I just meowed to him, because I was like, You're I feel like I'm dealing with a domestic cat. So I was like, <laughs> meow! <laughs> and he grabs my ski pole, and he starts playing with it. I was like, holy crap. I was like, this is a domestic cat. I was like, you can't be playing with this. I was like, you gotta go. And so we're having this exchange, and then all of a sudden he stops, and he breaks eye contact, and he just kind of is like, oh, I'm looking over here, and he just totally disengages from me. I was like, what would make you do that? <laughs> so I looked down the probably about 25 to 30 feet to the to the exit that they were coming in and out of the barn crawl space. And I looked down there and that female had came back in and she's like now looking at me. If you've ever seen like a cat, I don't know if you have a cat, but most people have seen this from domestic cats are kind of sitting there and you can tell they're they're debating on pouncing or just watching. <laughs> but their their haunches are down. They're kind of sitting on them and they're kind of locked and loaded. And at that point, I was like, okay, I need to get her out of here again. And that's what I ended up firing that flare. I picked a safe spot to just discharge it. She took off at that point really quickly. So I actually ended up using the second flare that I had to scare him out. And then I I just tracked him from that point on there. And I just kept following him for the rest. Probably the most of that day, I followed those guys. And I came back down, went up the other side of the mountain to track wolves and see what those guys were doing, just trying to again, create that buffer. But that was a perfect example of like a different option that was taken and was very successful. In that moment, Marcus, I felt like I was exactly where I needed to be doing exactly what I needed to do. It was a very tangible, it was very palpable. That experience was like exactly building the bridge between humans and animals. I left that day with a beaming smile. I happily hiked up the mountain, tracked wolves, and I left that day and I was just like, how cool is that to be in that presence of those animals, be able to use non-lethal tools to move those animals out. I was able to teach that rancher, like, let's close this building up. Let's not make it a place to sleep during the winter. And it was just a really beautiful moment. And it was like, wow, everybody 
lived that day. He was able to get his machine. The cougars never came back. And I was able to do exactly what I wanted to do. And that's just facilitate real change using this bridge technique. That's something that Oh, it just made my heart glad, man. I just felt really good about that day. And any days that follow that I can do that have been some of the most amazing and memorable days of my life. Doing what he does, Daniel Curry has to have that animal insight, as I've already mentioned, and empathy for both humans and animals. But no doubt, some other virtues and talents, things like patience, forbearance, diplomacy, a quick mind, and unflinching fairness. But as I try to imagine being in his shoes, or I should say on his horse, I can't help but think about the unusual solitude and isolation that must be part of the picture. Working as a range rider, a person probably has endless time to be alone with one's own thoughts. And with all the time he has to reflect on things, it's clear to me that Daniel Curry has an outlook on local problems and local solutions that is also informed by his vision of life's bigger context. I was watching this documentary back-to-back once, and one of them was about space, and it was when Hubble was a big deal before James Webb Telescope, in photos of the farthest distant images that we've actually captured of our universe, and they're just littered with galaxies. You know, our universe has countless galaxies that we can't even fathom how many there are. And, you know, I kind of go about, I'm like, wow, that's really neat. And kind of put it in the back burner and not thinking about it. Go about the the rest of the evening, find another documentary. It's about the ocean. The ocean's always held a spot in my heart too. So they take this cup of seawater and they put it under like an electron microscope and they're examining the seawater. And it looked very similar to that picture of all those galaxies. And I was like, wow. So... (laughs) <laughs> you have an infinite, as far as a human eye has ever been able to grasp and see, and it looks just like a cup of water from the ocean that we're currently living right next to. It really taught me perspective at that point. I was like, wow, a lot of life is just perspective. So that actually has gone into other portions of my work. When I'm looking at somebody and I'm hearing them talk, I try and like switch to their perspective and try and understand what are they looking at? Is it the same thing? Am I looking at the galaxy and they're looking at a cup of water and it's so similar? But I think it's human nature to see the world revolving around us. And that's just kind of normal, especially in Western culture and civilization, especially in our current technologically driven world. And I think it's really good to have an epiphany moment where you're like, I am so small and, and infinitesimal almost in ways. But in the other side, each action from each person can be such a powerful catalyst of change. Daniel Curry is a range rider in eastern Washington, and his story is told in a new book about wolves and humans in the Pacific Northwest. The book is titled The Return of Wolves. It's by Eli Frankovich. If you enjoyed Daniel Curry's wolf story, you'll want to join us next week to meet another great human being doing similar work in a very different place, a world away, a hemisphere away, actually, because we'll be traveling to Uganda to visit with a veterinarian who navigates the borderlands between gorillas and humans, trying to ensure that both can prosper. That's next week on Constant Wonder. Thanks for listening. I'm Marcus Smith. Today's episode was produced by Eric Schultzka with help from Mamie Teeples and Colson Darrington. Sound design was by Addie Mangum and Dallin Jepson. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. 